Wow, you were getting to hear what really goes on behind the scenes there for a minute. And whether you're watching online or you're here in the sanctuary, welcome to our service this morning at Northwest Barrie United Church. It's a very busy service. Uh, it's our third Sunday of Advent. We got drums today. Always a good day when you have drums. And the choir's going on the road this afternoon. Three o'clock, call your street. United we sing. If you can make it, we'd sure like to see you. It's going to be a lot of good music. After the service, please join for a time of fellowship and refreshments in West Tenniel Hall. We'll begin the service with our gathering song, number 48, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. We're going to sing the first two verses. We'll greet, then we'll sing the last verse.
good morning, everyone. And welcome to our service at Northwest Ferry. It's the third Sunday of Advent, the Sunday of joy. So that was a nice, joyful way to start the service. So thank you. Welcome to those watching from home. We're so glad to have you joining us as well. We always like to start by saying good morning to anybody who might be visiting with us or maybe here for the first time. And or if you're celebrating something, we'd love to know what special day this is for you. Anybody like to share anything this morning? Yes, Kathleen. Norma Balmer turned 29 on the 15th yesterday. <laughs> Norma Balmer had her birthday yesterday on the 15th. Congratulations to Norma. Norma's not here today, but we wish her well. <laughs> Ron. So I know not everybody heard Ron, and I know people at home didn't hear, so let me try and get it right. Ron, you lost your wallet on the GO train a, a few weeks ago, a few days ago, and it was returned to you. You don't know who returned it, and all the money that was in there is still in there. So that's a really nice, uh, that's a nice Christmas miracle. Thanks. Anybody else? Trinity. Yes, Taylor's hat back. Welcome back, Taylor. I think there's a couple of announcements today. If anybody has them, I'd like to invite you to come forward. Good morning. Uh, just a reminder that there is Candy Cane Lane after church today, so it's open to anybody who wants to shop. Um, you can go up there and make a donation and uh, purchase something for someone special. Uh, also, we're having a pageant rehearsal after church in the sanctuary. Um, just so everybody else knows, we're going to be singing and working in here. And, um, and then we'll be having our other pageant practice at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning. And also just a big, very big thank you. Um, this week I delivered well over 65 uh, gifts to the Women and Children's Shelter from Northwest Ferry United Church. So thanks to everyone that helped the Sunday School make that a beautiful impact, and uh, they wanted to say thank you so much. They were very, very grateful for all the generous donations. Thank you. Just a couple of other... Am I on? Yes, a couple of other announcements. Um, you may have noticed when you came in on the table at the front door was a basket and had some granola bars in them and that was a gift of thanks from the uh, blood, Canadian Blood uh, Services. They've been advertising, of course, on our front lawn with their sign. Um, they wanted to say thank you to us and also to let us know, to let everybody know that they're 700 spaces short of where they need to be uh, for blood donations. So if you've thought about donating blood or are able to do so, I know they would really appreciate hearing from you. And finally, uh, as we've already alluded to, next Sunday is a big Sunday here at Northwest. It is Christmas Eve. Rare that it lands on a Sunday, so that means we have three services. Um, we've got our pageant service at 6.30 uh, with our kids. We've got our candlelight service at 10 o'clock. And then we also have um, our morning service at 10.30. A couple of notes about the morning service. Um, you'll notice when you come in that there will be snacks at the door. When you arrive, there won't be anything after church, so you can get your coffee before the service begins. Um, we're going to have a slightly different service. Um, it's called the Chrismon service. So we did this seven years ago when Christmas Eve landed on Sunday. It's a very unique kind of service. I think you'll really enjoy it. So we hope you'll come out uh, for that uh, next Sunday morning. And finally on that Sunday, we do invite you, as we always do, the last Sunday of Advent, to wear your favorite Christmas sweater. I'm going to ask Carol to stand up and show her the one she's wearing today. So it can be a beautiful, pretty sweater, or it can be an ugly sweater like Carol's. I'm only saying that because it's got a cat on it. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'll relax. Anyway, so wear your favorite Christmas sweater and we'll get some Christmas cheer going here next uh, Sunday. 
Let's begin our service of worship now with our call to worship. Gather, sing, lift your voices in praise. This is a season for joy. The lights and decorations build the excitement. Christ, the light of the world, is coming. Let us celebrate in song and prayer the message, God is with us. Our opening hymn with our choir and our drums is the Virgin Mary had a baby boy. Let us stand and sing together. Please join me now in our opening prayer as it's found on the screen and let us offer this prayer together and let us pray. We gather again at the beginning of a new week. For many of us, the days ahead will be filled with frantic activity as we enter the final stretch to Christmas. Today, therefore, we pray for perspective that in our rush, we don't miss the wonder. In our preparations, we don't miss the joy. This is a beautiful time of year, captured in lights, song, and story. Open our hearts to the message of Advent, that in our waiting, peace and hope can touch us like a flame touching a candle. Whether we are busy in the days ahead or whether we are quiet, may this season of waiting allow us to capture again the gift of the Spirit that dwells in and through all things. Amen. Today, with our Advent candles, we light the candle of joy. Joy and Christmas go hand in hand. Joy is watching the excited smile of children sitting on Santa's knee, sharing their hopes and wishes. Joy is the gathering of loved ones around a table filled with food soon to be tasted and conversations to be enjoyed. Joy is the moment when Christmas opens your eyes and ears and hearts to a little bit of magic found in the decorations, music, and symbols of the season. What does the joy of Christmas mean to you? For Maya Angelou, whose prose and poetry were born from times of struggle 
and times of inequality and injustice. She refused to let life steal the inner joy that was brought to her by her faith. Joy for her was a decision that even life's hardest blows would not diminish the inner light. So let me share with you three quotes that Maya Angelou wrote on joy. Joy is a freedom. It helps a person to find his or her own liberation. The person who is joyous takes responsibility for the time he, she takes up and the space that he or she occupies. You share it. Some of you have it. You share it. That is what joy is. When you continue to give it away, you will still have so much more of it. And the second quote, when you wish someone joy, you wish them peace, love, prosperity, happiness, all the good things. And finally, we need joy as we need air. We need love as we need water. We need each other as we need the earth that we share. As we sing now the third verse of Hope is a Star, I'm going to invite Thea, who is playing Mary in the pageant on next Sunday, to come up and light our first three candles.
is amazing. Uh, and I'd like to invite the children that are here. If you want to come and join me at the front, I'd love to have a chat. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. Are you all in the pageant next week? Not all, some of you, yeah, yeah. Can't wait, it's gonna be great. Um, this morning we lit the candle of what? Joy, right, oh, you guys weren't even here when we did that. We lit the candle of joy. So tell me what brings you joy at Christmas. Joy is that feeling of happiness, that just that excitement. What makes you excitement, a cider fills you full of joy? Jane. Um, having that family to be around. Having family to be around, Jack. Presence. Dougie. Uh, this is what you can't wait. Can't wait. Going a hole in one in golf. Getting a hole in one in golf? If you can find a golf course open on Christmas Day, you do that. Anybody else? What brings you joy at Christmas? Desiree. Good food, for sure, absolutely. Anything else? Thea. Giving to others. Giving to others? That's great. Well, you know what? One thing that I did last week that I was really fun. Has anybody gone down to Springwater Park and driven through all the lights down there? That's pretty incredible down there. You should, everybody should go and do that. It's a lot of fun. And it will fill you full of joy for the season. Um, so we've been looking at different Christmas specials during children's time. So we, uh, two weeks ago we did uh, Charlie Brown. Last week we did Rudolph. So I want to show a clip from a, a movie that I know you guys all know. How many people have watched Elf? Elf, right. So... For those of you who don't know in the congregation, it's my turn, Dougie. For those of you who don't know in the congregation, Elf is about an elf who lives at the North Pole, but he leaves the North Pole and comes down to New York City to try and find his real dad. And he goes to New York City for the very first time in his life. And we're going to watch the scene when he experiences what life outside of the North Pole is actually like and try and feel the joy of this Oh, by the way, before we start, we can't get the ads out, so we have to watch a couple of ads first. That's just the way it goes with YouTube. Here we go. We could keep watching that all morning, right? So it's a great movie and it's all about joy. And what I love about this is that he is coming down and he's experiencing something for the first time. And often we feel joyful when we see something for the first time. Now, we can't experience Christmas for the first time, right? Because you guys have all been through Christmas lots of times. But the challenge of joy is to try to see things like you're seeing them for the first time again. 
right? There's a passage in the Bible that said faith is seeing things with new eyes. It doesn't mean we put new eyes in our head, but it means we try and see things uh, for the first time like we haven't seen them before. You got a call, Jack? <laughs> Perfect timing. So for example, let's say that you go home today and you walk in the door and I want you to look at your tree and I want you to pretend you're seeing your tree for the first time and go, wow, yeah, look, that's really cool. Or maybe you're out driving and you're driving around and you're like, all the lights are on and you have, I've seen lights so often. Try and see them for the first time and see what they look like. Or, or maybe when you're opening a gift, even if you know what it is, pretend you're opening a gift for the first time and that's how you will feel a sense of joy. So I want you to try and see this Christmas with fresh eyes, see if you can find the joy in all the great things that are to come. Desiree, you've been had your hand up for a while. I didn't know that. Thanks for sharing. Okay, so guys, you are going to go with uh, Lori and have a play practice. Good luck, and I will see you next week. Have a joyful, joyful week. And let us now can oh let us invite Ashley is what I was gonna say. Good morning. My name is Ashley and I am here to give you one last final update on our Christmas campaign. This week was a big one for the campaign. Our goal is to raise ten thousand dollars before Christmas Eve. And we have raised over half of that in the last seven days. You have shown us through words, as well as your contributions, just how important Northwest United Church is to you. And for that, I wish to say thank you. I'm going to share a few more of your whys. And as always, I encourage you to take a look at the board in the lobby where they are all posted. They will be there throughout the holidays and into the new year. I apologize if I don't read your entire why. I have chosen a few short snippets so that I can share as many as possible. Our church embraces diversity and practices inclusion. I love that each person is celebrated for being their unique, beautiful selves. Walking into Northwest, that vibe jumped out at me. The chatter, the smiles, the positive, busy atmosphere, Phil's leadership, the choir and the music. It was so uplifting. I don't want to miss a single Sunday. The feelings of warmth and welcome radiates the moment one, en one enters, and the coffee hour encourages guests to return to find a church home so dedicated to helping others in a variety of causes is inspiring. There is joy in this church. This will be the last week that I am up here addressing you in regards to this campaign. My hope is that next Sunday when you come in or turn on your TV, there will be a giant message on the screen announcing that we've reached our goal of raising $10,000. I am confident that we can do it. Donations are welcome through Christmas Eve by using one of the green Christmas envelopes or by making an e-transfer through to the office. You have shown us over and over again how incredibly special Northwest United Church is to you. The things that we do here are only possible through your generous donations. And so for that, I express my deepest gratitude for all that you do and all that you give. Thank you for making this place a home for so many. And thank you, Ashley, for your leadership for this uh, stewardship program. Let us now continue to worship God as we present and dedicate our morning offering.
there's no greater joy than knowing that our gift, our generosity, has helped another person, has lifted a heart, has lifted a spirit, has helped someone out of a situation that they were in, has made someone breathe a little easier. We thank you for the gifts of this congregation, and we thank you for the joy that it brings to our church and our community and into the world. May you bless these gifts and those who offer them in your name. Amen. This morning I'm continuing with my series on Are You Serious? Looking at those moments in the Christmas story in which those participating may or may not have said, Are You Serious? Uh, when confronted by something they never expected to be confronted with. So this morning I'm going to talk about the shepherds. Let me share with you the passage in the Christmas story. Now in that same region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you this is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said. And Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as it had been told to them. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our light. Amen. Over the years, I presided at many many funeral services and memorial services. And I've sat quietly and listened as family and friends took time to share their memories and say their goodbyes to moms and dads, spouses, grandparents, sisters and brothers, friends, in ways that have touched me very deeply. I've heard tributes that have made me laugh, tributes that have made me cry, tributes of such eloquence they could put the greatest orators to shame. I presided at services that have filled the church and some that have barely filled the row. Each one special and meaningful in its own way, each one an attempt to capture the beauty, the meaning, and the deeply special nature of a life. Each one stands out for me for its own reason, but there's one service that I know I will never forget. It was a memorial service I was asked to officiate at here in Barrie about four or five years ago. It was for a gentleman who passed away. The man had lived the final years of his life on the streets of Barrie. He didn't have a home. He didn't have any immediate family. The closest relative was a distant nephew who came from far away to make the arrangements. I asked if he would offer a few words at the service to share some memories of his uncle. He declined, but suggested that maybe I should just open it up to whomever was there. I'll be honest, I wasn't sure that was a good idea, but I certainly didn't want to deny that request. When the time came for the service, the chapel began to fill. It was quickly apparent that most, if not all, of the people gathered there to remember and to honor this man were also from the streets of Barry. They knew him and had known him for years. You could say that they were his family. Many of them were poorly dressed, some were poorly cared for, unfamiliar with the protocol of a formal funeral service. But they were there. The chapel was packed. They were there because they wanted to be there. They were there because they couldn't imagine being anywhere else. And when the time came, I will admit with some reluctance, I asked if anyone would like to say a few words. 
thinking that this might be the shortest memorial service ever. What happened next was almost magical. One by one, people from this unconventional family came up and just shared one story after another about their time with this man. Often the language was raw and harsh. The stories they told were raw and harsh. I learned a few new words that day. <laughs> but what was expressed may have been raw, but it was also real and genuine and honest. And they painted for me a picture of a man who may have had very little, but he knew what love was, he knew what generosity was, and he knew what friendship was. The memories and stories kept coming. One man even brought up a guitar and played a little song. But what moved me most of all was at the very end, someone came forward and simply lit a single candle and set it down without saying a word. And there was this almost sacred, knowing silence as if the candlelight itself was paying tribute to this man. I was moved like I had rarely been. When the service was over, there was no reception, nothing formal to attend. And like shadows, these people disappeared again into lives that I knew nothing about. Lives to which I could probably never relate. And I knew I would probably never see most, if not all of them again. But I realized that what we just shared was something really special. For those few moments that day, we all became a family. All there to witness to, participate in the celebration of a life. And when people are together because life has drawn them together, whether it's a birth or a death or anything in between, often very special things can happen. Let's put that story on the shelf for a moment. I'm going to come back to it later. But I want to talk for a few moments about shepherds. Because even if we don't know much about the Christmas story, we all know that there were shepherds somehow involved. In fact, we can probably almost quote the line, and there were shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night, when, lo, an angel of the Lord appeared to them and said unto them, Go to Bethlehem to see this child that has been born, the Savior who is Christ the Lord. And the shepherds said, Are you serious? Okay, I paraphrase that last part. But the Bible in the story is pretty clear that the first witnesses to the birth of Jesus were shepherds. But who were the shepherds? And why were they summoned to a stable? Before I get into that, I have to point something out that might be a little bit disturbing. After the service last week, I got a text from my mom, who was watching, and she texted, You ruined my Christmas. What do you mean there was no innkeeper? <laughs> I said, Mom, I didn't say there wasn't an innkeeper. There probably was. I'm just saying the Bible doesn't actually say that there was an innkeeper. We assume there was one. So I'm going to really upset her for a moment more with the shepherds. <laughs> It says that there were shepherds abiding in the fields. In the area around Bethlehem, it is very rare to find shepherds and sheep because Bethlehem was known for growing grain and barley. It was known as the breadbasket of the ancient world. So it would be strange for there to be shepherds and sheep in that area as sheep grazed in grassy plains, which were much further away from Bethlehem. But there was one time of year where sheep and shepherds did appear in the hillsides around Bethlehem. It was after the harvest of the grain and before the new grain was planted. The shepherds would bring their sheep to graze, and they would graze on the stubble left behind from the barley and the grain, and they in turn would fertilize the fields and prepare for the next crop. It was a perfect balance between shepherds and farmers. In that part of the world, do you know when grain is harvested? In June. So guess what, folks? If we take this story as it is and insert that little in, uh, tidbit into the story, well, we're celebrating Christmas about six months too late. <laughs> it's lower likely that Jesus was born in the height of summer than he was in the depths of winter, which, if you follow this, would make Jesus a Cancer, not a Capricorn, which actually makes sense because they're a very loving uh, people in, under that sign. So there you go. Merry belated Christmas, and I look forward to the text from my mom following the service today. <laughs> But regardless of that, who were the shepherds? Well, I'm sure you don't need me to tell you that they weren't very high on the pecking order of that ancient world. And that's an understatement. 
There was little that ancient people of different tribes and races could agree on back then, particularly Jews and Gentiles. But if there's one thing that they could agree on, shepherds were kind of gross. They held the dubious position of being at the very bottom rung of the social ladder. Jewish people saw them as ceremonially unclean because they worked among some animals that were forbidden from, from being eaten in the Bible. They believed that if you even shook the hand of a shepherd, you would yourself become unclean. As for Gentiles or non-Jews, shepherds had a reputation for being thieves and scoundrels. Even though there's little evidence to support this, perception is everything. And shepherds were never to be trusted. In no place in that ancient world were shepherds held in high regard. Instead, they were looked down on, scorned, mistrusted, and avoided. There was one thing, though, that shepherds were really good at, despite other than taking care of sheep. Shepherds were really good at communicating and storytelling. Shepherds were part of a Bedouin tradition in Jesus' day. And the Bedouin were a nomadic people. They were known to be master storytellers. Have you ever heard of a social media influencer? That's a person today who has an ability to connect with hundreds, sometimes thousands of people over social media to get a message out. Often companies hire social influencers to sell their products online because they're so well connected. Shepherds were kind of like influencers of their day. People didn't like shepherds, but they liked each other, and they often had deep family and tribal connections throughout the hills of the surrounding area that would exist for miles and miles, so news between them traveled quickly. In fact, there's a line of thinking in scholarly circles that suggests that shepherds are to be thanked for the fact that we have the stories of Jesus at all. Remember, the first gospel account of Jesus' life wasn't written until 40 or 50 years after Jesus' death. Some believe that what kept the story alive in those 50 or so years were shepherds, passing it from one tribe to another in the area that is today modern Palestine. According to some, it was the shepherds that kept the stories of Jesus alive all those times. So friends, you heard it here first. Shepherds were the very first social media influencers. But let's go back to what I said earlier about them being the lowest of the low. Here are these guys on a hillside, living a life that most people knew nothing about or wanted to know anything about. They lived a shadowy existence. Polite society wanted them to stay in the hillsides, far away from places where they could dirty the homes or lives or minds of people. They weren't wanted, and they knew they weren't wanted. And so to the hillside and far away places, they quietly went about their business. Until that night, when an angel appeared to them and said, I want you to leave behind the sheep. Leave behind your hillside home and go to Bethlehem. While you will, where you will find a baby, a baby that is the most special child to ever be born. You are to be the eyes of the world that will first look upon this new life. Folks, if there is anyone in the Bible story who truly did say those words, are you serious? It would have been the shepherds. And not because they were being asked to leave behind their homes and their livelihood, but because they were being invited to something that shepherds were not invited to a significant event in the real world. When the angel said to the shepherd, come to Bethlehem, do you know what the angel was really saying to the shepherds? You are seen. You are valued. You are worthy. You know, each week I progress through the Christmas story and share those moments that I call the I, are you serious moments and try to find a message that we can take away for our own lives. So the first week I talked about the angel appearing to Mary saying you're going to give birth to a, a child, are you serious? And I talked about pondering the things, big things that happen in life. Last week it was the innkeeper who opened the door and saw this couple and are you serious? I talked about seizing opportunities. So what about those shepherds? To me the shepherds have something to say about worthiness. Let me go back to that opening story because I couldn't help but draw parallels between that memorial service and the shepherds in the Christmas story. The people there were not shepherds. They didn't come down from the hills. They weren't gathered to witness to a baby. Their summons was not by an angel. But like the shepherds, they were the other. They came from street corners, alleyways, shelters, and rooming houses. They emerged from the shadowy places where few of us would ever dare to venture. 
They were called to that place to witness to life, the life that is found when we honor its passing. They were not known to the world, but they were known to one another. But the point was when they gathered together, something quite wonderful happened. And in that space made holy by shared memories and shared experiences, a light shone in the darkness, and the darkness could not overcome it. You know, who really knows what happened that night that Jesus was born? Who knows who was actually there and how they got there? Who knows if the story somehow got changed and enhanced as it was passed from one listener to another over the hillside of Bethlehem? But isn't it something that when Luke went to write this story, he was very definite in making sure that the shepherds were kind of the stars of the show. He was very definite in wanting to let its readers know that the story is for everyone, but most especially for those that everyone may have missed or forgotten. He wanted the message to very clearly be, you are worthy, you have value, and you are seen. Friends, there are many shepherds out there. We know that. We see them as we go about our daily routines on the street corners and in the alleyways. Men and women who live on the figurative hillsides surrounding the society of which we all have our place. They are noticed, but not necessarily seen. They are present, but rarely invited. They are part of us, but not really part of us. But don't fool yourself into believing that shepherds are just out there. There are shepherds in here, among us. Sometimes there are shepherds within us. No human being, despite outward appearance or status or wealth, no human being is immune to feeling unworthy from time to time. If you think back over the year, can you think of a time when you felt that you were on the outside looking in? when you felt that your value or your worth was not seen, a time when you wondered if you fit in, a time when you doubted yourself, perhaps a time when you stayed on the hillside because you weren't sure if there was a space where you wanted to be. My guess is that you can, because unworthiness is an inner journey that we all take from time to time, and it's not a nice feeling or a place to be. It's horrible to be noticed, but not to be seen to be listened to, but not to be really heard, to be welcomed, but not to be affirmed, to be tolerated, but not to be valued. We all know or have known the stain of unworthiness. Just this past week, I was speaking to a woman whose 24-year-old son had told her that he was gay. And this woman said that every Christmas they would go to her mom's house for dinner, and she knew her mom would have strong feelings about this. She was terrified to ask her mom if her son would even be welcome in her home based on this new revelation. And so with great reluctance, she told her, and do you know what her mom said? Of course he's welcome for Christmas dinner, but he needs to know that I don't accept his lifestyle. It was heartbreaking to me when I heard that. Friends, there's a difference between being welcomed and being affirmed. There's a difference between being looked at and being seen. There's a difference between being listened to and being heard. There's a difference between being tolerated and being valued. That young man is a shepherd, destined to remain on the hillside, lest he dirty the lives of those who see him as unworthy. The shepherds are not just out there on the street corners in the back alleys, but they're all around us. They exist when the bonds of unworthiness enclose a heart. They exist when someone has been pushed aside they exist in the shadowy places within, in the rooming houses and back alleys of our own fears and apprehensions. They exist when someone is made to feel like they don't count, like the other. But then suddenly an angel of the Lord appears and says to them, get up and go. And the shepherd said, are you serious? Not because they didn't want to go, but they couldn't believe they were being invited to do so. One of the greatest triumphs of faith is when a human heart can transfer itself from a place of unworthiness to a place of affirmation. That's when the angels sing, and that's when there is rejoicing at the manger. When those folks gathered for that memorial service in that funeral home, there was light, 
because for those moments unworthiness was pushed aside and love and peace and hope revealed itself as they celebrated this man forgotten to the world but cherished to them. The gospel of Jesus Christ that started in the manger all that time ago is a story for everyone. It's a story of God's expansive, complete love that invites us all from the hillsides of our own doubts and unworthiness to claim for ourselves a place in the kingdom of the wanted, the affirmed, the listened to, and the loved. The call to the shepherds on the hillside is for me the most powerful part of the Christmas story because it's a call of acceptance, a call of justice, a call of redemption, a call of peace, and it's a challenge. It's the challenge to all of us to do the hard work of our faith, which is the work of finding the lost and healing the broken, loving the despondent, and inviting into the light of worthiness those who've wandered for too long in the hillside of despair. To let those know who are desperate for connection, you are seen, you are heard, you are valued, you are worthy. That's the work of our faith, and that is the call of Christmas, the call to God's amazing, redemptive, and complete love. It was Christmas Eve, 1905, in Baltimore, Maryland. A street person by the name of Arnold Saunders looked down at his feet and spied a $1 bill. He picked it up. A smile crossed his face. With this dollar, he was able to buy enough alcohol to help him forget what day was coming up tomorrow. He shuffled off down the road towards the liquor store. On his way, he passed the sporting goods store. In the window, he saw a baseball bat. Suddenly, his mind was filled with violent images. He remembered the day 20 years ago like it was yesterday. He'd been hanging out with a group of friends when a group of kids from another gang approached them. Harsh words were exchanged between the young men. A fight broke out. Arnold noticed a baseball bat on the side of the road. Picking it up, he started to swing it wildly. It connected with one of the young men. It broke his skull, killing him instantly. Arnold was arrested, convicted of murder, and spent 15 years in prison. When he came out, no one wanted him, and he had nowhere to go. Hence his life on the street. As he looked at the baseball bat, he saw the price underneath. One dollar. He looked in his hand, one dollar. It was the season of Christmas, the season of hope, and a voice told him inside that this was his opportunity to make amends. He went inside, purchased the baseball bat, continued up the road, and came to St. Mary's Orphanage. He rang the doorbell. One of the sisters answered the door, and he told her all about his story, said that he wanted to give this baseball bat to somebody who needed it. After a few moments, she called in a skinny young kid, no more than 10 years old. Holding out the bat, the man said, Merry Christmas, son. The young boy, who himself had been abandoned by his parents, for whom Christmas was nothing to look forward to, suddenly felt a surge of joy. Thank you, mister, he said. This is the first baseball bat I have ever owned. The old man smiled. With warmth in his heart, he turned and shuffled away. The boy's name was George Herman Ruth, later known as Babe. Although he would own many bats during his lifetime, he'll never forget the first, or the face of the old man who one day made Christmas come alive, who one day made him feel worthy. There were shepherds abiding in the fields when an angel appeared and said, Go and witness to life. The call of Christmas is the call to gather in, to gather in from fear, to gather in from grief, to gather in from failure, to gather in from rejection, to gather in and circle around this child of love who came to restore to humanity its value, its goodness, and to say to all of us, you are worthy. Are you serious? You bet I am. Amen. Let us pray. God of Christmas joy, the world eagerly awaits the coming of the celebration of light and love. With one more week to go, we pray that this time of worship may be fruitful and expand our faith. In the midst of our preparations this week, may we all take time to reflect on the Christmas story and its meaning for our lives today. As we think of the shepherds today, we are invited to look around us and see where there are gaps in the circle of acceptance. 
we are invited to ask ourselves, who is being missed in this season of love? Open our hearts this day and this week to be fully present to what is going on around us and within us. Where there is brokenness, may there be healing. Where there is loneliness, may there be connection. Where there is confusion, may there be clarity. Where there is turmoil, may there be peace. God, keep drawing us back into the story of the child. Gather us at the manger of love, that we may not just believe in the good news of our faith, but that we may in turn bring it to life in the world as we do the work of Christmas, the work of widening the circle of love and acceptance. Continuing now in prayer, we take a moment to consider the needs that we have for ourselves and for our loved ones. And so in silence, we lift our prayers to you now. God of Christmas joy, send us into this week with a commitment again to be light and love. And may we take upon ourselves the task of doing the work of this special season as ambassadors of the child of love. And hear us now as we continue in prayer as we sing together the Lord's Prayer. us today and for everybody for joining us at home thank you have a great final week before christmas and we'll see you here next sunday on christmas eve our closing hymn is i am the light of the world let us stand and sing together
Enter into the rushing, demanding, noisy world again, refreshed in courage, strengthened in spirit. We will continue to prepare ourselves for the coming of Christ. Go in peace and have a joy-filled week ahead. Amen.